Okay, for our next uh, section, we start with naming acids. It's one more type of um, molecular compound that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, it's acids. Uh, we'll get into the details on uh, what acids are and how they act and um, you know their reactions and things like that uh, later on in the second semester. But uh, for now, just suffice it to say that acids are uh, molecular compounds that are composed of hydrogen and a negative ion. Their main characteristic <coughs> um, is that, they, uh, chemically anyway, is that they increase the concentration of hydrogen ions in water. And so in other words, uh, in water is an important phrase here, acids are only acidic when they're in water. Uh, so they're only named as acids when they're in the aqueous phase. In fact, many acids can exist um, or many, many compounds that are acidic in water can exist outside of water, but since they're not in water in those cases, they're not acids and they're actually given different names depending on whether they're in the pure state or dissolved in water. Um, some of the, <clears throat> oh, so an example first might be hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid has the formula HCl, and um, it is the acid that's in your stomach. But HCl also exists in a pure form, which is a gas. And as a gas, because it's not dissolved in water, it's actually called hydrogen chloride. If you then put that hydrogen chloride in water, much of it will dissolve, and it becomes HCl aqueous, which is hydrochloric acid. And that hydrochloric acid in turn ionizes and becomes H plus and Cl minus. And it's the fact that it created new H plus ions in water that makes it an acid. But of course, it doesn't actually do this when it's a gas. It only does this in water. Okay, um, <clears throat> some of the properties of acids, and we'll go over more when we get to acids and bases as well in the second session. For one thing, they taste sour. Uh, some of us may know how sour our stomach acid tastes through means that I won't uh, detail now, but um, yeah. Acids are pretty sour. Um, uh, lemons and limes and um, oranges all contain citric acid, which is the main reason that they taste so sour. Uh, vinegar uh, is mainly acetic acid, and that's why that's so sour. Uh, they have a low pH, so low pH numbers mean acidic. Anything below seven means acidic, and anything above seven means the opposite, which is basic. And acids neutralize bases and also are neutralized by bases. So basically you add an acid and a base and you get something that's neutral or closer to neutral than the original acids and bases were. And many metals dissolve in acids, but not all of them. <clears throat> there are uh, essentially two categories of acids that we um, need to be aware of for naming purposes right now. <clears throat> there are also some others that um, you know, you'll get to when you get to the chapter on acids and bases. Um, there are binary acids and there are oxy acids. Uh, 
um, oxy acids are the ones that involve polyatomic ions as the negative ion. Okay, so for binary acids, Uh, hydrogen or uh, uh, binary acids are made up of hydrogen and one other nonmetal, like HCl, for example, made up of hydrogen and the nonmetal chlorine. That would be a binary acid. And the names are formed like we named the form, like we formed the name the, of hydrochloric acid. <clears throat> Starts with hydro, then the base of the other nonmetal ending in ick and then acid. And so to um, write that down, uh, the name, it would be hydro followed by the base name of the other nonmetal. ending in ick and then followed by acid. <clears throat> and some examples of those would be, well, HCl, we already saw that. Hydrochloric acid, there's H, uh, HBr. And, um, just to keep things official here, I'm going to put in a little AQ after each of them. Yeah, because remember, as a gas, HCl would be named as hydrogen chloride. As a gas, HBr would na be named hydrogen bromide. Um, H2S, when it's dissolved in water, is hydrosulfuric acid. As um, a gas, that would be called hydrogen sulfide, which is actually a common name. It technically should be dihydrogen sulfide. <clears throat> okay, and so that's basically the way you go with the um, uh, with the binary acids. That's pretty simple. For the oxy acids, uh, rem rem uh, remember. These are the ones that involve oxygen containing polyatomic ions. And uh, let's see, there is um, A table in chapter three, uh, table 3.5, which actually gives the oxyanions. And the number of hydrogens involved in the formula really depend on the size of the negative charge on the anion. And because, of course, the hydrogen ultimately has a charge of plus one, so you need one H plus for each negative charge on the anion. <laughs> and so if you um, have, say, an acid involving the anion nitrate, NO3 minus, the formula for the acid would be HNO3 because you only need one H plus because the anion is only negative one. 
if you have the sulfate ion, the equivalent acid is actually H2SO4 because you need two H pluses to cancel out the minus two on the ion. If you have the, some, the phosphate ion, which is PO4 minus three, then you need three H pluses. Like so. <clears throat> Um, okay, uh, so for the names. Naming of oxy acids. <clears throat> the name of the oxy acid actually depends on the name of the oxy anion. If the name of the oxyanion ends in ATE, then the acid name is the base of the oxyanion name with ic tacked onto it and followed by the word acid. If the oxyanion name ends in ITE, then the acid name takes the form of the base of the oxyanion name with OUS tacked onto it, followed by the word acid. And so um, some examples are probably the best way to illustrate that. Okay, so if you have So if you have the formula HNO3 you would note, hopefully, that it involves the nitrate anion, which is the NO3 part, and therefore the acid name would be nitric acid. Uh, if you have H2SO4, the SO4 part is sulfate, again, ending in A-T-E, and that is sulfuric acid. <clears throat> so it's not sulfic acid, it's sulfuric acid. Some of these um, rules don't apply uh, universally exactly in every case. If you have H3PO4, you look at the anion, that's phosphate. And this would be phosphoric acid. If you have HClO4, <clears throat> the ClO4 part is chlorate, or sorry, perchlorate, the perchlorate ion, and that would be perchloric acid. And HClO3, that's just chlorate for the anion. And that would be chloric acid. Uh, Hc2H3O2, if you look the uh, C2H3O2 up in the list of polyatomic ions, 
that's an acetate ion. And that would be acetic acid. So all these were ion, ions ending in ATE. <clears throat> now for some that end in ITE. HNO2 involves the nitrite ion, and so that's nitrous acid. And H2SO3 involves the sulfite ion. And so that's called sulfurous acid. HClO2, in that one, the polyatomic ion is chlorite, and so this would be chlorous acid. And there's also HClO, which involves the hypochlorite ion. And that's hypochlorous acid. So that's uh, another reason that you need to not only recognize the polyatomic ions when you see them, but uh, know whether the names end in ATE or ITE. Because if there's an acid made from it, it's going to make a big difference in the name. Okay, the next section we get to is formula mass and moles for compounds. The um, whole idea behind this is actually very similar to what we've already done with um, you know, individual atoms, except uh, in a molecule, there's um, more than one atom. So you just add the masses up and you have the formula mass for the compound. <clears throat> so we define formula mass as the mass of an average molecule or formula unit of a compound. Um, notice the word average. And <clears throat> what that means is that you can use the masses from the periodic table for the various elements that are in a given compound. Uh, remember, the masses in the periodic table are actually just weighted averages of the masses for um, the individual isotopes of that particular element. And basically, every element has uh, at least two isotopes. And um, we take a weighted average of the masses of those isotopes, and that's what appears in the, the periodic table. If you're talking about the formula mass for an individual molecule, that individual molecule is going to involve certain you know, individual atoms of a particular element, and those individual atoms will be specific isotopes of that element. And so a given molecule containing a certain element um, will have, you know, will have its own uh, characteristic mass based, based on which um, uh, isotopes of the elements are involved. But um, that would mean that we would have to know which isotopes of every element uh, in the compound are present if we want the mass of just one molecule. What we're really doing in the case of formula mass is we're finding the mass of an average molecule. Because in most cases, we're going to be working with huge numbers of molecules anyway. And so when you look at all of those billions and billions of molecules as a whole, all of the isotopes are going to average out so that the mass of any given atom of an element is going to be basically, uh, for the entire sample, it's going to average out to the same as it is in the periodic table. Uh, so that's kind of a long discourse on why the word average is in there. It just makes it easier for us. We can use the masses in the periodic table 
instead of knowing specifically which uh, isotopes are present in a given molecule. <clears throat> and the formula mass is just the total of all the atomic masses for the elements present. And those masses come straight from the periodic table. <clears throat> A one way of writing it in more kind of formal mathematical terms would be the summation of the number of atoms of element n times the atomic mass of element n. OK, that's nice. But looking at actual, actual examples will probably help more. So for H2O, the formula mass is just going to be Uh, two times the atomic mass of hydrogen plus one times the atomic mass of oxygen. That's two times one AMU plus one times 16 AMUs. And that comes out to 18 atomic mass units per molecule. Now, of course, as we've already seen, the masses in the periodic table can also be read as grams per mole. So it's 18 atomic mass units for every molecule of H2O, or 18 grams per mole of H2O. And it comes out the same. Or uh, sugar like a six carbon sugar like glucose, the formula C6H12O6 so the formula mass is going to be six times 12 AMU for the carbon plus 12 times 1 AMU for the hydrogen plus six times 16 AMUs for the oxygen. Which is 180 atomic mass units per molecule. Or 180 grams per mole. Technically, the uh, mass in atomic mass units per molecule is what we mean by formula weight or formula mass. Um, and grams per mole would be what we uh, refer to as um, molar mass. Okay. <clears throat> um, sometimes uh, an older term which is not as accurate, but is uh, e easier to say, and um, often used by old farts like me, uh, is molecular weight. So if you, know, if you hear molecular weight, it's really just the same thing as formula mass or molar mass, uh, essentially the same thing. Using molar mass with the idea of moles and Avogadro's number,
or in other words, counting by weighing, uh, it gives the, the molar mass, um, gives the relationship between mass and number of moles. Okay, and then once the number of moles is determined, then you can actually find the number of molecules if you want to. You, so you can find a uh, number of molecules or a number of parts of molecules. So if you're dealing with glucose, you could find out not only how many glucose molecules there are in a sample, but you could find out how many carbon atoms there are in the sample. Because we know how many carbon atoms there are per molecule of glucose. So if we know how many molecules of glucose, you just multiply by six and you've got the number of carbon atoms. <clears throat> okay, so an example of that is How many H2O molecules would there be in a kilogram of ice? A uh, kilogram being a thousand grams. Notice I put a peer, um, decimal point uh, at the end of 1000, so it has four significant figures, not just one like it would if I hadn't done that. Well, if you have a thousand grams of H2O, and we saw above here that uh, each mole of H2O has a mass of 18 grams. We want the grams on the bottom. So that it will cancel out with the units we started out with. And we come to 55.5 repeating moles of H2O. the number of moles of H2O. Times Avogadro's number. Which is the same for everything, remember. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd items of whatever those items are would be the number in each mole. And we end up with 3.34 times 10 to the 25th molecules of H2O. Okay, you don't have to do it in two separate steps like I did it. Um, you could, uh, instead of writing down the number of moles here, you could just put this conversion factor directly after that one and just multiply through all at once and you would end up with the same answer. Another uh, example might be what would be the mass of 1.05 times 10 to the 25th formula units of HCl of NaCl. Well, here, of course, if you're going between number of items and mass, then you always have to go by way of moles. So the first thing here is you take what you're given and find number of moles. Okay, so we have 1.05 times 10 to the 25th formula units of NaCl. There's one mole of NaCl for every 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units. 
And if we divide this out, remember uh, when you're dividing this, uh, remember to put parentheses around the entire number you're dividing by in this case. Otherwise, the calculator will misunderstand what you want. So it's 1.05 times 10 to the 25th divided by parenthesis 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd close parenthesis equals, and you should get, um, whereas, oh, I didn't write that down because I did it all in one step, but I don't have space here. So 1.05, five times 10 to the 25th <clears throat> divided by parentheses 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd close parenthesis equals, that's 17.44 moles of NaCl. You can then take that and look up sodium and chlorine in the periodic table and find out what their um, uh, atomic masses are or molar masses. And you'll find that um, they add up to 58.5 grams per mole. Twenty-three for the sodium and thirty-five and a half for the chlorine gives you fifty-eight point five, and that would be one thousand twenty ah, grams, and that actually is the correct number of significant figures. That would be three without a decimal point. The zero at the end doesn't count but the zero between the one and the two does count. So that's three significant figures. And we had three significant figures in the original number and in the 58.5, so, and in the 6.02. So three it is. <clears throat> okay. Um, section 3.8 is about composition of compounds. And we'll get to that right after this message because we're just about up to the half hour mark. So I'll see you in the next segment.